So I grew up kind of hearing his English twang around an Australian accent. It's awesome, by the way. And it's so nice to have someone who speaks a bit more like me than, uh, hey, I'm Gina Tramarco. <laughs> Uh, oh my gonna god! Get, I, love, I, I, I love your voice, Gina. Oh my gosh! I must admit, I love working with Americans, but it is nice every now and then when I when I get to work with an Australian. And- I mean, I could just you know, I could just sit here and let you guys do the show. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm good with that. I well, mean, Susanna likes to take over anyway. So what can I say? What can I say? <laughs> Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About. This is Gina Tremarco, Master Sales Trainer at Sales Gravy with my amazing saucy co-host, Susanna (laughs) Gray-Jones. Susanna Gray-Jones. And it is a battle of the accents today because we have an accent here similar to yours. And you know, us Americans, we cannot tell the difference between a British and an Australian accent. Uh, So this is going to be fun. Welcome, Matthew Pollard to the show. Thank you very much. And you got it right. So I'm very impressed by that. I have to say, in regards to the accent, so my audio book is actually recorded by an English person. And I get so many compliments about how amazing I was in my (laughs) audio book. (laughs) <laughs> because it sounds like me, but it, it's not me. I know. That's Why like- didn't you do it? You've got the great accent. Well, you're going to learn. I have. I had a reading speed of a sixth grader growing up, so nobody wants to hear me read a book for six hours. It would be a seven and a half to twelve hour edition of The Introvert's Edge. So I think I did everyone a favor. And I think the person that, that recorded it is actually an actor. I think he did an amazing job. I would have loved to have done it, but it. You got to learn what your competencies are and what your competencies aren't. Fair play, fair play. One thing I know that um, us Americans are bad at is telling the difference between the two accents. And I learned this from uh, both my Aussie and British friends who are like, the, when I assume like, oh, you're from England. No, I'm not. And Do you have versa. British friends? Do you have British friends? Yeah. So, I mean, I was in door to door sales when I was in, you know, just straight out of high school. So a lot of the people you know, from England will come to Australia as backpackers and they'll do door-to-door sales, B2B or residential. So I had a lot of English friends that said they were coming for a year and then just never went home. Uh, but also what, what's interesting is, you know, Australia has a lot of South Africans, a lot of people from New Zealand as well. And as, as you'll know, so many people will go, oh, you're English. No, you're South African, you're New Zealand. So I've always told people that it's always better to say, you're fr- are you from New Zealand as opposed to Australia? Because we don't get offended when somebody calls us, you know, says we're from New Zealand, but I'm not sure if it's the other way around. And, you know, the South African and the English accent, I'm not sure if a lot of people say that to you. Are you South African as opposed to English or do you get English all the time? I always get English. Really? Um, Very lucky. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's great because obviously I do quite a lot of work for Sales Gravy, which is an American company. And I'm I'm like the the abnormal one there. I'm the one that stands out by being English. And I, I actually ham up the English a bit more sometimes just to kind of, just so Gina can take the mick out of me. Oh, please. <laughs> but it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's comes in, it comes well in speaking, right? And um, I, I think I wonder, you know, I've been stalking your LinkedIn profile. And one thing that someone said was that they, I have seen hundreds of speakers over the last few decades. And Matthew was one of the best. He's down to earth, Introvert, introverted style is a breath of fresh air and his content is amazing. So where's this introvert come from? I want to know about this. I got in with the first question. <laughs> well, I think that that, I mean, I think that my speaking style is being authentic. And I think that's, you know, a lot of speakers will perform very, very well, but they won't fall on their sword often. And, you know, I think for me, one of the important things is you know, and I, I speak at a lot of sales kickoffs and conferences like that. And I, you know, a lot of times I, I think that I share strategies and advice and talk about stories and examples. Sure. But people can get into their head that this person's a superhero. They've got the, the natural gift of gab. I can't do that. And I think one of the, the superpowers I have is as we get further down, I'll talk about the fact that, you know, I fell into door to door sales purely because I lost a job in data entry just before Christmas. There was no job that I could get except commission only sales jobs that were hiring. And, you know, the, the place that I ended up working was this company that said, we just throw mud up against the wall and see what sticks. I was one of the 20 pieces of mud for that week. Fun saying until you are the mud, right? 
So <laughs> for me, I, I share this story about how this guy that was introverted, reading speed of a sixth grader, had horrible acne, colored lenses so I could read. You know, not the guy that you're seeing on video today, definitely. But I, I think that's the point though, right? A lot of times we see people as they are today and go, oh, I could never be like them. Right. So, I mean, I've been on the, the Sales Gravy podcast a couple of times and, you know, Jen's an introvert and we'll have a dialogue about the introverted strategies that work for him and the introverted strategies that work for me. And similar to speaking, I think that I'm systematic in my approach and I think that that is important. So I'll get up and I'll start with the story because as I, as I mentioned on one of the podcasts with Jen, stories have the natural ability to activate the reticular activating system of a person's brain, which basically means that our brains synchronize. So the moment I get on stage, I have a set period of lines that I will always say. Now, I may customize them depending on the event, but I practice them over and over again. That's the only thing I'm practicing before I get on stage. Then when I get on stage, I say that and then I'll say something like, how will I live up to such a wonderful welcome? I know. Let me tell you about Wendy. And then I'll start telling a story. And then I go in and, and, and I find that a lot of speakers will provide fire hoses of information and overwhelm their audience. So what I like to do is share stories of application so people can see themselves in those stories and feel that they're more tangible. But as an introvert myself, that also makes me feel totally comfortable on stage. And I think that then when I get to the point where I share my personal story, it brings me down to a level that people are, oh, he was just like me, perhaps even worse off than me. So that when I bring myself back up, I'm not just lucky that I've been able to show others. It's I've lived it and therefore I get exactly where they're at, and especially because my keynote to sales kickoffs is storytelling. I teach story through story, which also makes it a pretty easy thing to get people to understand why it works so well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the whole storytelling thing, oh, Gina is just speaking her language because she runs runs courses on this and we, I, I love it. And it's something I'm certainly learning about, but also showing that vulnerability. That's something that I've learned very recently that Jeb does and you, you see keynotes speakers doing having that trust to share with an audience you've never met before and saying to them i'm actually gonna give you a bit of myself it is it, it's, it's hard to do I, I don't know if i could actually do that honestly really? I, well really that, that's interesting I, I think that well so firstly introverts have a, a big trouble with doing it without planning and then they'll judge themselves heavily afterwards so you know, for me, I, I talk about my introversion openly and it, it was interesting. So while I do a lot of sales kickoffs, I speak a lot to small business groups as well because I built five multi-million dollar businesses from the ground up. So Yes, the I, festival. I, I, yes, that was that was one of the the businesses that I started when I got to the US. But I, like, I talk about the fact that most people have really strong functional skills, but if they start their own business, often they don't know the three things that allow them to create rapid growth. And because of that, they get stuck in this hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale, fighting on price really is what it ends up with. And it's all because they don't know how to differentiate niche and create a sales system. So when I talk to small business, I'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about differentiation, niche marketing. And then I'll tell my own introverted story before I talk about sales systemization. And I think it's that introverted journey that people connect with. They're like, oh, I can do that. Now I understand and I believe that I can do it. And even if you're, you've got a strong extrovert in the room, the stories of my success will get those people to listen and to know I started from a place that's worse than perhaps they started with allows them to feel that they not only respect where I am, but they are happy with the fact that they, they, they perhaps got an advantage over where I started. So I think that at, at our ability to share vulnerability makes what we do accessible, but it also allows people to go, well, I can do it too. For someone like me though, and I, don't get me wrong, I've got a lot better at this. I think when I first started I've got this photo that I put up of me at my sister's wedding with really bad acne. And I, I, I make a joke before I put it up and I say, now, and this is, oh, bear in mind, you're only going to get to see this, this slide for about two seconds. And I put the slide up and then I, I switch it off and everybody laughs. And the reason why I, I put that slide up is, and it took me a lot of time to be comfortable putting it up, is because again, people see me as I am today. They're like, well, this person's naturally charismatic. All of it's planned, all of it's prepared. I mean, that's what introverts are great at, by the way. If you're an introvert listening, you can be amazing at sales. You can be amazing at networking, amazing at speaking from stage, but it comes from your amazing ability to plan and prepare. Then you can leverage things like active listening, uh, great empathy, which um, introverts are great at. But if you don't do the planning and preparing, you're not going to feel comfortable sharing yourself. And truthfully, you're never going to be happy with the way you did it. So when I put that slide up, I talk about the fact that that was me at my sister's wedding and you want everything to be perfect for your your sister at a wedding, there's nothing I could have done about that face. 
But I'd written out exactly what I wanted to say, and I practiced it over and over and over again. And the reason being is if I was going to be vulnerable, I was going to choose not, it it wasn't that I didn't want it to be real. It's that I wanted to choose the words that I said to make it have the biggest impact. And I wanted to make sure that the words that I used didn't make me not be able to sleep tonight because I embarrassed myself or I felt bad about it. So choosing the fact that I was going to include it and choosing how I was going to include it allowed me to do it and feel like I can be more vulnerable in front of people, but do it in a way that felt safe to me. And I think that's what introverts don't do enough. They want to be free and vulnerable, but they don't want to do it. They, they, they feel unsafe doing it. Well, if you plan and prepare, you don't have to do it off the cuff and then feel bad about it. I, I've got I got two things to throw into that one that might seem a little um, uh, counterintuitive. Um, I find it really interesting, right? I agree with you, the preparation part of it and, and whether you're introverted or extroverted, I think that is really important. It, it's almost to me more important as an extrovert to prepare because I'm too much of a loose cannon. So I really need to prepare. <laughs> but having owned an improv comedy theater for 12 years and having trained improv performers, the thing that I never expected was that the majority of my performers were introverts. And they were the most talented. And so it kind of goes a little bit against the preparation part because they couldn't prepare because they had to improvise and take suggestions from the audience and create something which drove them slightly batty. So I had to break them of their need to prepare. And they were extremely analytical about their every move. And after a show, when we would talk about what you could have done better, right there, they were very analytical. They had to have every possible formula and I had to break them of it to let them get to the point of letting loose. But they Mm. were the more talented ones because like you said, they're better listeners. And so the fact that they listened to the audience better and took suggestions better and they were comfortable with the silence made them incredible performers. And you put them on stage and there was something that happened to them. They felt safer on stage because they could become somebody else on stage and that felt safer. So that that's one. And the other one, the vulnerability part, um, this, this happened to me during COVID when I went to speak at an event. I had to go speak at an event and and the original topic was no longer relevant because of COVID. And I had to figure out what I was going to talk about. And in the moment at the last minute, I completely went renegade and just improvised the whole talk. And I told my story of 2020 and how I, I lost my business, how my my improv theater was shut down. My sales training company was shut down. And I just spoke from the heart. And it was the first time I actually did that. Like I, I, I'll put myself out there, but it was really, truly from the heart, vulnerable, n- no plan. And I had a line of people wanting to talk to me. And it was such an aha. I was like, I should be doing this more of these types of talks. So those are, I just wanted to throw those in. Um, But what do you think of that? These improv performers that the best ones were the introverted ones. Well, so firstly, I will tell you that there are very seldom an industry where the introverts aren't the best in the business over time. And what I mean by that, I mean, let's think about the world of sales. If we were to think about the best sales trainer and speaker of all time. And I'm sure Jeb won't mind me saying this, but Zig Ziglar is probably the most well-known and most highly successful speaker in the world. Well, if you think about that, Zig Ziglar was an introvert. Now, if I think about, you know, I spoke at the AISP summit recently and we surveyed the audience. Now, firstly, by the way, a lot of them didn't know what introversion was, and we should definitely talk about that because what people think introversion is and what it actually is totally different. But what I will tell you is that Some people responded with, oh, I was introverted, but don't worry, I'm not introverted anymore. Like that's even possible. It's it's not because people are embarrassed about being introverted. But when you think about it, if we think about it, and people always go to, you know, Bill Gates and Elon Musk are introverted. Well, okay, but that's fine. But these people have got really successful businesses because of the technology they came up with. So it's less accessible. But if you think about Zig Ziglar, well, he was an introvert and he's in sales. Think about Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group in the world. He was an introvert. Think about, well, introverts know they can't do small talk. Okay, well, Oprah Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres are both introverted. If you think about, oh, we can't do stand-up comedy. Well, some of the best comedians in the world, uh, like Jim Owen is an introvert. You think about 
um, actors, well, Leonardo DiCaprio is sensational. He's an introvert. Bill Murray, who I would is have, he? no is way. He? Sorry, go for it. Is he though? Because I challenged that because I have many, um, and this is why I want you to come up with your definition, because I have many debates with my friends about what an introvert is and what an extrovert is. And there's actually quite a few definitions. So I'm keen to know, what do you think in your, your, your definition um, is, is an introvert? I mean, firstly, you're 100% right. I think psychologists have made it way, way, way too confusing. Maybe because they keep getting grand dollars every time they make it more confusing. But I think that the answer is, is simple. It's where you draw your energy from. Like with the festival that you mentioned, Small Business Festival, when we first launched that, Jim Cathcart, who's probably the most award-winning speaker in the world, came and was the closing speaker for that event. And he was around the event for three days and so was I. The difference was at the end of that three-day event, I mean, I spoke at the event, he spoke at the event, we were all busy with it. I had a wonderful time. doesn't mean introverts can't enjoy networking sales, it's, uh, it's speaking from stage. But at the end, I wanted to go home, put on a hoodie and watch Netflix and talk to nobody. He was jazzed up like he'd been on charge for three days and he wanted to go down and experience the live music capital of the world in Austin. And I have never in my life had to ask a seven-year-old if I could please go home. I was white, (laughs) right? But he was my guest, so I took him out. So the thing that introversion is, is just this. If you draw your energy from being by yourself or with maybe one lo- one or two loved ones, then you're, you're an introvert. If, if you draw your energy from being with people, then you're an extrovert. Now, where this gets tricky and where I think a lot of the tests fail us is they ask questions like about, they ask questions about skill sets around networking events or do you enjoy, I enjoy networking. I enjoy speaking from stage. So realistic, I could say I was introverted once, but I'm not anymore. But the truth is, it still drains my energy. I'm just good at it and I love doing it. Now, truthfully, it drains my energy much much less now because I have a networking strategy. I have a sales strategy. So one might say I enjoy it a lot more, that maybe I'm more extroverted. That's not the case. I'm introverted. I just have great systems. Now, going back to the improv things that you were suggesting, it's really interesting. So when I started teaching storytelling, one of the the events that I did, I spoke at a -A Make-A-Wish Foundation conference. And it was really interesting. We did a retreat where we built out their stories. And one of the things I talk about frequently is most people think they tell great stories, but it's always so matter of fact. Customer wanted this, so we gave it to them. And I talk about creating what I call a three-dimensional value articulated story, which has where we go into depth in the problem, where we talk about things from an opportunity cost, a real cost, and more importantly, an emotional cost. Because especially if we're selling to corporates, a lot of people forget they're selling to a person that's worried about losing their job if it goes wrong, excited about getting a promotion if it goes right. If they're selling to an individual, they still don't focus on the totality of the emotional journey of the product that may impact their lives. So we talk about that. Then we kind of take people through the the outcome, uh, sorry, the implementation and then the outcome from those three directions again, and then look at the moral. And when I help people understand the entire framework, what's really interesting is the introverts always outperform the extroverts because they see the model in their head. And because of that, they can tell amazing stories. And at this, ama- at this Make-A-Wish Foundation, I-, I got told that I should spend special time with this one person. In their words, they said, he can't even tell the story about how he met his wife well. So he's not gonna, he's gonna really struggle with, with a business story. Now, by the way, the story about how you met your life partner, the way you tell that, at this, when you first started, it starts perhaps a little bit bulkier than it should be and you take some things out, you just learn to embellish on parts. I know the story of how I met my wife, when I tell it with my wife, It's a theatrical masterpiece now. We've grown it over time. But when you tell a story the right way, it has almost the same emotional impact as telling a story about how you met your wife or husband or partner if you tell a business story the right way. Well, this guy who couldn't tell the story of how he met his wife, he could see the framework and he told a story off the cuff, well, with a little bit of practice during that session, but pretty much on the fly, that was the best story at the event. So a lot of times when we say, okay, when you look at something like improv, you just have to be able to get up on stage and let go. There are skill sets and strategies for letting go that people can learn. There are mindset strategies that I've learned to be more comfortable when I walk up on stage. There are strategies for how I look and who I talk to when I get up on stage. Those strategies have allowed me to feel more comfortable. I love that. But do you really think it's that black and white that you've got extroverts and introverts and they all have those characteristics? Or do you think that there's an element of this that is you and your life experience that has made you you like this? 
So I think that, I mean, with everything, there's a spectrum. So firstly, there's a spectrum of introversion and extroversion. There are also things like shyness and chronic shyness. And Mm -hmm. shyness and introversion are not the same thing. Secondly, there are people that aren't introverted, but they're depressed. They also sometimes don't want to go out and talk to people at the moment, Mm. right? Mm. So there's lots of things. I mean, for me, I like going to networking events because I have a system. If I didn't have a system, you'd say I would be much more introverted. No, I'm an introvert that just has a system or I don't. And I will tell you, I was speaking to Meredith Powell just recently and her mother, she said, I hated my mother for this. But every time I went to a, uh, on holiday or went somewhere, my mother said it was my job to seek out the person that had no friends and make them my friend and introduce them. And because of that, over a long period of time, that's become a natural ability. But to me, a lot of strategies that I have learned have now in a lot of ways become natural abilities that I have because I'm so well practiced at them. But when I try my hand at something uh, something new, I make mistakes. For instance, when I started speaking from stage, I mean, my number one rule in sales is it's not about me. My number one rule in, uh, in networking is don't make it about yourself. So I teach people networking scripts. So instead of talking about your functional skill and your resume and credibility, I will say, when somebody asks you what you do, you introduce yourself with a unified message. Mine's the rapid growth guy. And then when somebody asks me what that is, instead of saying, well, I'm a sales trainer, marketing trainer, and I work exclusively with, with introverts to help them succeed and obtain rapid growth, I'll say something like, one of the things I love to see more than anything in the world is an introvert with enough skill, talent, and belief in themselves to go and start their own business. But what I just hate seeing is, and, and then I continue on, but it's got nothing to do with me. It's about my passion and mission for that demographic. It has a different impact. Well, when I started speaking from stage, the first thing I did, and this came from fear, the first thing I did was I started to just open the fire hose of information. I was training. I wasn't keynoting. And because of that, I wasn't getting clients out of it, which is the reason I was speaking. The next thing I did is I led with the story of why I deserve to be speaking in front of them because I felt like I needed to leverage credibility because they were looking at this kid at that time. I mean, I was, you know, early 30s speaking from stage in front of a bunch of people that had six-figure business, seven-figure businesses teaching them how to obtain rapid growth. So my lack of confidence led to me saying, I need to lead with my story. Well, in retrospect, that was crazy. Of course, it should have been after some other stories about what was relevant to the people I was speaking to. And I could have humbled myself instead of showing everybody. It came across like I had an ego for myself. And when a speaker that I I value his opinion very much, I I mentioned him in in my book, when Tom Singer came to me and said, Matt, I loved your keynote. You've got this credibility that other people don't because you've actually built successful businesses. But I heard the word I 36 times before I ever heard why it was relevant to me. If you move your story to there, all of a sudden, and that was the keynote that then led to all the awards that I've won for speaking. Why didn't I notice that? It was because I didn't have the systems and strategies to be able to succeed in that. Yeah, exactly. I, I've got a question for you because um, I, when we have these debates, I'm often told that I am an extrovert um, because I, I draw energy from other people. Does that mean um, I can't be a top sales performer? Well, so here's what I will tell you. Brian Tracy, who is an extrovert, says the top 10 of 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. Now, of course, the introverts sit at the top of that lower 80% for the obvious reason that introverts without a great system are terrible. Mm -hmm. But the top 10%, there is a higher number of introverts in that world than there are extroverts. Now, why is that? Because without a system, we're terrible at sales, so we hold on to it for dear life. Now, an extrovert can absolutely learn a sales system, but they're more likely to not want to take the backward step that learning a system takes because you're always a little bit better with your winged process than learning a system that feels uncomfortable at the beginning. But if you embrace a system, it gives you some advantages because you can work with the system and then leverage your natural gregariousness to do really well. Now, that said, you do, as an extrovert, have some disadvantages. Your ability to actively listen and your ability to empathize tend to be disadvantages of an extrovert. Now, the reason why I don't focus on helping the extroverts as much as I focus on helping the introverts is you've got a lot of books written for you. Everyone knows that you're the best in the business. May not be true, but everyone thinks that you're the best in the business. (laughs) Well, apparently not a good active listener. (laughs) And here's the thing. You can go and get coaching if you're not. And don't get me wrong, there are parents that have taught and ingrained that in their extroverted kids and they're better at it. Now, sure, an introvert with a natural ability can do it better 
than an extrovert that had no coaching. But actually, an extrovert that has coaching on active listening, because an introvert is leveraging their natural ability, an extrovert can learn to be better at it. So all of these things are skills gaps. Everybody has their burdens to bear, but an extrovert focuses on their, what they have as issues, empathy, active listening, and says, oh, I'll go and get training. Or if they work for a global corporation, HR might say, oh, you need training on this. And they've read a few books and they realize that that, can, that is coachable. The difference is an introvert honestly believes that they cannot succeed as an, extra, uh, as an introvert in sales or in networking. Which, first thing, is totally untrue, and most of their sales leaders, or at least a large majority of them, are probably introverted. So it's that barrier that we need to break them free of. But personally, I believe, I mean, Jeffrey Gittemore is a huge believer in sales systemization. He's also a really strong extrovert. He and I on his Sell or Die podcast talked about it for like an hour and 20 minutes. I don't believe that anybody can't be an amazing salesperson, but I do believe the best are always people that follow systems. I, I'm so confused now. I'm not sure if I'm an introvert or an extrovert. I'm really confused. I think I know. <laughs> what? A lot of people listening may also be. So if I was to ask you, if you went to a networking event uh -huh. and then you spoke to a whole bunch of people that you don't know well, you had a whole bunch of conversations and then they said, actually, you know, instead of being involved in a networking event, would you mind just getting up on stage and doing a keynote on a specific topic, and then you delivered that keynote topic. Mm -hmm. When you got off stage after the Q&A was done and the endorphins of doing something that either terrified you or excited you started to dissipate, would you feel that you needed some quiet time for yourself to recharge, or would you feel so excited that you'd probably suggest to everyone at the networking event, let's take this to drinks afterwards? Quiet time. And you're an introvert. See, I don't think people would believe that about me but I don't know if it's true. I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I, I love you, by the way, Matthew. I love you. Um, <laughs> but, or oh, and. <laughs> I, um, and I, I think this is a really good debate because I think there are a lot of us that are automatically considered extroverts. And I mean, I consider myself more an ambivert, but I, I, I think it's because I push myself to be an extrovert because I, that was my way to get past what is actually a shyness that people don't realize I have. Or could people bring it out? And I ask you, Matthew, could people bring out different sides in people? Because, you know, with some people, I would like to go home, put my hoodie on and just hide. But some pe other people, True. I'm like, That's yes, good. I'm queen of the party. Yes, I'm having all of it. And I am the best actually. When you're with <laughs> me, when you're with me. So here's, here's what I'll tell you. There are still so-called extrovert arenas that drain me a lot more than others. Of course, there are people that drain me more than others. I mean, I like to say I love everyone equally, but nobody ever does, right? So the, the fact of the matter is, and, and don't get me wrong, there are also introverted things that introverts commonly like, like sitting, reading a good book that I personally can't stand, mainly because I have a reading issue and it just takes so much energy from me. Everyone is different. But the problem is that, and the biggest thing for me is, if you believe you're an introvert, you think you have it a barrier. The other thing that I, I, I find that I have an issue with is a lot of people believe that they need to be more extroverted to behave in those arenas. And I think that that's what, and, and don't get me wrong, that's starting to change, which is great. What I look at is that a lot of people that are introverted, especially in small businesses, but even in corporate, believe that they have to act extroverted to be successful. It, it makes them feel inauthentic. It makes them feel incongruent. It takes a lot more energy from them. And it's actually mentally tolling when they go home because they're reliving those moments. What I have found is that by focusing on system and process, I'm able to be more of my authentic self and then go away from an event happy, feeling like I portrayed the best version of myself. Now, when you think about a, a, from a perspective of different people, you're 100% right. Occasionally, I'll get talking to someone that's incredibly sarcastic and I'll be having a dialogue and I, I don't, I'm not that I don't have a sense of humor, but when somebody has a really light joking personality, and they're always jumping between joke to joke. I can't think that quick sometimes. So because of that, I try and control the conversation and what my safe zone is. Every now and then, somebody is just won't let them let me follow my system. And because of that, I fall back to a much stronger version of introversion, right? Because I feel uncomfortable. There are certain times that I feel more introverted. There are certain times that I'm talking about my favorite topic. Try shut me up. I feel more extroverted. 
right? Because of that, there's no hard and fast rules, but I think that it's the overcomplication of this that's actually hurting us when we're trying to learn things because we don't know. And because of that, we can't then pick up a book written by an introvert or pick up a book that's written by an extrovert. And then we say, situationally, it's different. So what I would say is if you're learning sales and you feel more introverted when you're, when you're selling, then focus on learning from a Jeb Blunt, a Zig Ziglar, a Matthew Pollard. If you're an extrovert, then probably consider learning from a Brian Tracy or a Jeffrey Gittemore. If mm, you're learning mm. how to network, do the same. If you're learning how to be a great parent, learn from a parent that also is introverted. It's fine. Situationally, some of those things more uncomfortable. Do you think that when you, you said when you were younger, so let's take, let's go back to 12, 13 year old Matthew. Do you think um, he would have been surprised to see, do you think he would have looked at how you are now and thought, that's not me, that's an extra bit? Oh, absolutely. So yeah. I, I actually have a keynote I, I, I wrote about a year ago that's called Channeling Your Superpower. And it actually starts with me getting up on stage and saying, you know, look where I am. Thank you so much for this large organization. If my, if my 16-year-old self, I didn't say 12, maybe I should, my 12-year-old <laughs> self could see me today, he would never have believed it. I am a totally different person now than I was when I was 12. But a lot of that is what I believe is possible now is very different. You know, I was very quiet. I had, a, you know, I'd, I'd grown up in school because of my reading issues feeling like I was the slow kid. I had bad acne because of that. I was, you know, they're teased a lot of the time because, and because of my finely colored glasses, I was as well. When I got older, I remember take, seeing photos of me with really bad acne and feeling really bad. The truth is that my ability to learn these strategies and systems have made me feel more comfortable and actually allowed me to do what you would call an extroverted behavior, right? Which is talk around topics as opposed to follow scripted responses to Yep. specific questions that I'm asked. So I believe that I now behave a lot more extroverted than I would have ever dreamed possible. But it comes from a total comfort in my knowledge What and the fact that we're talking about a topic matter that I understand really, really well. You take me and put me into a personal life event and a lot of times I'll get jumbled in my words or I'll say something, I'll use the totally wrong word for something that I mean or I'll say something that doesn't land and I'm like, sorry. Right, I still have those intro, those introverted characteristics in my personal life. But you think about it, and for the people watching that are like, "Oh, I'm not sure if you're introverted anymore," mm. it, I'm talking about what I'm truly passionate about, the thing that I know best of all. And you two are totally, you know, why you talk, talk about sales? You don't talk about this specific topic all the time. So because of that, I mean, there's no one here that has more domain expertise on this topic than I do. How can I not feel comfortable? And truthfully, there's no one probably more passionate about this topic than I am. So how can I not speak with commitment to the to the topic? Mm, well, I think we need a part two of this of this uh, show, because uh, unfortunately we are out of time. It's so sad that we have to wrap this up um, before we before we go. If people want to connect with you um, find out more about you. What is the best way for them to do that, Matthew? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can go just type my name into Google and you'll find I take up most of the first couple of pages. But I would suggest, I mean, for those people that are interested in learning, firstly, that they can sell or they can network as, as an introvert, I would suggest that, I mean, they don't need to buy my books. My publisher hates me when I say this. You don't need to do that. If you go, <laughs> if you go to the introvertsedge.com, I'm really committed to helping introverts realize they can succeed, that they're not second-class citizens. So the first chapter of both books will help you get past that belief that you can sell or you can network as an introvert. And then I literally give you the full, in the sales book, for instance, I give you the full seven-step strategy to how to sell. So if you grab the chapter headings, put what you currently say into that, you'll realize, firstly, some things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. Then, you know, put the things in order that need to fill in the gaps, which is usually around asking questions, telling great stories. You'll double your sales in the next 60 days. So I think the starting point is go to the Introvert's Edge, download that first chapter or check out the Introvert's Edge podcast. Fantastic. You'll definitely do that. Definitely. Well, unfortunately, we we got to go. We got to we got to wrap <laughs> up. Let's um, go ahead, Susanna. What? Would you rather? Don't forget the would you rather questions. Yeah, we just got to do it in like a minute because I, okay, okay. I've got like- Matthew, <laughs> Matthew Pollard, quick, quick question. Would you rather have a rewind button or a pause button on your life? Now it has to be a quick answer. <laughs> oh, rewind, definitely. Rewind. 
Interesting. Well, rewind gives you a pause, right? You can always pause and think, but you can also rewind and just replay the event and change uh, it. I didn't say you could pause <laughs> and rewind. I just said you could rewind. <laughs> but by rewinding, don't you get to relive the same situation again? So it's kind of better than a pause button, I yeah, would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. What, what do about, you think, Gina? What about you, Susanna? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I, w- I, I would, oh, I hate to say it because I like to disagree, but I actually agree with Matthew. (laughs) I think it's true. I think it's true. I mean, there are some moments you want to pause, but then I get impatient. I'm an impatient person. I want to see what's next. And then, yeah. So you you would pause or you would rewind? Rewind. You would rewind. Okay. What do you think? what, What do you think I would say? Oh, guess what Gina thinks? I would go, what do you, th- I would go with pause because you like to be different. I would say that Gina wants to pause right now because I know she has to go to another meeting. So she's like, let's pause this. We'll pick it up at another time. <laughs> uh, no, I, says, I would definitely, I would definitely pause. And I think the, for me, the pause is about, I don't want to go backwards. Like I want to just go forwards. I don't know. That's that's a nice philosophy. That's uh, that, there's nothing wrong with rewinding and going backwards. I just I want to go do the next thing. Therefore, I would pause. I love like it. Love it. Awesome. Well, we definitely have to have you back for part two because I think we've only scratched the surface with you. So if you're cool with that, I think we should have you back. Absolutely. So, so let's make that happen. And um, to our listeners, hey, if you have not been to Sales Gravy University, go check that out at salesgravy.university. And don't forget, Outbound is coming up in September in Hotlanta. Um, you can get those tickets now for Outbound, both in person and virtually. So go to outboundconference.com. I'm Gina Tremarco, um, a master trainer at Sales Gravy, saying bye, Warners. Thank you, Matthew. And um, I'm going to let Susanna Gray Jones close it out. So long, farewell, listeners. Have a lovely evening. And thank you for joining us, Matthew. It was lush having you. It was lush. Lush. My pleasure. Thank you.